welcome, but we're not real. We're just testing you. So I'll welcome you again in a few minutes. I found out from Hernan that when the airplanes go by, it doesn't register on there. In Mary other words, Cromer is watching. Hey, Mary. William Weinbaum is watching. Hi, Mary. So what that means is that you're coming through clear before we start officially. Greg is watching. Mary is a genius who was showing me how to use a cell phone. Meredith says, hey. Hi. Do I do my welcome smile? In half a minute. Okay. I'll go like this. I'll go like this. I look serious. Welcome, all of you. Welcome here. And thank you for being here. I have so much to tell you today. I would like to begin, as always, oh, first of all, a message to Tammy. I'm so proud of her. She had a hip replacement, and she did it, and she's wonderful. OK, let me put on my glasses. Because I'm going to, that's my mask. I'm going to begin, as I always do, with a drawing I did of a child who has autism. And his mother, Colette, a friend of the family, who began with being Joni's friend, but now is ours, I did, she said the hardest thing is that people don't realize when a child has autism, it can have tantrums, it can have behavior problems, not because it's bad, but because that's the illness. So this drawing, which Joni is showing you, it shows the mother saying to the little boy, it's okay, okay, Joey, it's okay. I know you're frightened of the noise and the place. Just try to breathe. And then the owner of the store says, I hope that they leave soon. They're upsetting my customers. And a little child says to the mother, Mommy, look at the bad boy. And the mother says, some people should never have children if he were mine. And another couple says, if I had that child for one second, a good, a good swat on the head would take care of that. And we need people to understand that don't judge. You don't know what causes a tantrum. It can be something that you are causing by noise. And that gives me the entry into speaking about judging. I spoke about not judging anymore, but that's an easy thing to say. Actually doing it, it changes everything. I remember looking at people and thinking, oh, she shouldn't wear that. It makes her look bad. That's not my business. It may be all she could afford. Or maybe she likes the color of it. But it's not my business. I have a friend named Martha who gives me wonderful insights. And she once said that she had a professor and in class, somebody asked about what is meant by God when he does this. And the professor answered, it's none of your business. And maybe judging is none of our business. What Eric used to do with his angers, as a concentration camp survivor, when I met him, he told me about the anger that was buried inside and that he had to learn to control it. 
because since there were no Nazis in America, he couldn't afford it. He had to unlearn it. So when it comes to judgment, I'm trying to be like Eric and to pull it out and say it's none of my business. Now I want to talk about something else. We're all isolated. At least we should be. If we're not, we're carriers. And there's so many things we can think about. We could begin, first of all, by learning. There's so much we have to learn. Look at your family. See if there are any problems which have been lingering for years. Do we need them? And if so, how long must we carry them? I had a situation in my family with two nieces whom I love very much. And when they were little, the families made get-togethers and you saw the kids and you could enjoy them and you could see them and they would speak to you and know you. And then one day we went to a retreat where there were a lot of children from mostly Asian countries. And they were so nice to their parents. And so I began to think, maybe in America, we should learn a little bit about being nice to each other. And I began to realize that I'm guilty too. If people don't contact me first, I don't contact them. And so I called two young relatives of mine and I said that I feel very neglected because we've become a situation where I send a check on a birthday and they send a thank you. And I told them that. And I said, I want more than a thank you. I want to get to know you. And I began to think about it and I realized I have a diction, a diary. I always keep a diary. But I opened one where I was 19 years old and I was so embarrassed. All I talked about in that diary was who spoke to me, what they said, what I said back, as if the whole world did not exist. If only my relationship with humanity, which was next to me, counted. And I wrote a letter. I called one of them, and that was the smartest thing I ever did. We cried together. And the other one wasn't there, so I wrote a letter. And I want to read this letter to you. This has become a series of sad moves. We will fall into the patterns of our family histories. You hurt me. No, you hurt me first. You have to make the first move. No, you do. Too bad I can live without you. And I can wait until you say you're giving up. And so I said I would call them. And I called. The first one that I called was there. And we cried together. And the second one was there. So I had written that letter to her. She called me the next night and she said, we both cried again. And she said, thank you. Because what I said was, when I call you on Monday, you might not be there. I shall try again, okay? Pride would be too childish for a 91 year old who does not want to be estranged from a niece she has always loved and always will love. Keep and I asked her if I could read that today, and she said yes. Read the whole thing. The whole thing? I think I did when I said, you hurt me, no, you hurt me first. That. And start thinking of what this pride cost us. 
because pride is always stupid. Honesty is not. We keep secrets in families. Let's not. Even if you're guilty, but don't accuse people because, you know, a long time ago, I had an issue with my daughter. And she said, Mom, why don't, you know, this was during the time of the hippie world when I called it the cult of ugliness because kids looked ugly. And in my case, it was, my daughter has a red sweater, which was threadbare. And Joni said, Mom, maybe it'll help you if we go for therapy. And I said, no, maybe it'll help you. And she said, no, Mom, we're going because of you. And we went to somebody, a wonderful woman, who had been Kenny's teacher at Columbia and was a wonderful therapist. And we went to her house. And Joni sat at one end and I sat at the other end. And then she said, really said this, pick a situation where you had a problem. And I told the situation. And then she said to Joni, now you tell. Joni said, that's not what happened at all. What happened was something entirely different. And I learned that we hear only what we need to hear. We have judgments here. And everything that you will say will bounce against that judgment, and you'll be wrong. Joni, could I have my painting? I promised Marsha weeks ago that I would begin to talk about painting. And I'm going to. Ten minutes left? No, 20 minutes left. 10 minutes, OK. You know, I love to work from life. And this is not New York. I love New York more than any other place because buildings have history. They don't have history here, but my daughter's backyard does. And I would like to explain oil to you. May I hold it? Can, can we show it while I hold it? Why don't I put it on the easel? And okay. Point to it. I just want to explain about oil. Guys, nothing is as wonderful as oil. Let me tell you why. I didn't know what to do here because I'm inventing. This is not really how our yard looks. Okay, you see, if this were pencil, if I would erase as much as I do as I change my mind, the paper would get torn. Oil does not. I took a rag and I wiped this whole corner. And then I added some branches of the tree that she has right there. And then I wiped the branches out, it was too much. And then I put the road, the that whatever you call boardwalk. it, boardwalk, where for one person to walk. And I was able to rub things out constantly. So oil is the, when you asked me last time why I love it, I love it because it's messy, but you can get rid of anything you want to any time. And she feeds birds. Not only does she feed birds, but there are even going to be parrots in there. I don't know where they come from, but there are parrots. And they're on the ground for whatever gets fallen down. And she has a kayak. And it's just only with oil could I do that. Because if I do watercolor, it doesn't have power. You can't get rid of things that you made wrong. Oil allows you to get rid of anything. Acrylic does not. Acrylic says a statement and it does it. It's there and it's solid. And you might have to scrape it off. So does anybody have any questions about oil? Is there any downside to using oil? It stinks. <laughs> And I am very serious because you can't do it in a closed room. You have to keep the window open. If you're in a class with everybody doing oil, they better have good ventilation. 
And I didn't know it until when Eric was having hospice treatment in my house. The nurse came in and she said, um, something is very dangerous here. And I said, what? And she said, I smell something dangerous. So she went into the next room and traced it to my oil painting. Since then, I realized, don't do oil unless there's ventilation. Anything else? How do you decide what you put in and what you take out? You don't until you're nearly done. But that's because it's oil. This was a white fence, <coughs> but it's, I can play with it. If this would be an old New York building, I couldn't change a window. But in a yard with trees, you can do anything. How long will it take you before this painting is finished? <coughs> it depends on the weather. Now that this time is so wonderful, and that I have unlimited time, I have no company. If I have company, they don't eat with me. I don't have to dust very much. Housework is minimal. And I hate to say it, but I've spoken to friends who also feel that this COVID time is a respite from life. Since I don't have young children anymore, and I don't teach anymore, oh, one of the Facebook questions was, where do I teach? I, it began about 50 years ago when somebody saw my drawings on an exhibit and said, could you teach me how to draw? And I said, I don't know how to teach. And she said, I would like to bring my mother and my sister and me and the only teaching you have to do is not to touch our work. So they sat down on my kitchen table and I learned how to teach. They told me what to do and I listened. So to this day, I have never touched anybody's work. And then it grew. More people found out about it. And instead of my kitchen table, we moved to the basement. And I've loved doing it. Joe Tripp says, so great to have you explain a different painting. Thank you. Love all your works. Who said that? Joe Tripp. Oh, great. And then Tammy Smith, who I don't think was on at the very beginning, so you may want to repeat what you said about her. She asked a question. How did you move your oil paintings from Orchard Street and back home in the car each day without ruining the paintings? Oh, I suffered. I suffered, but I took the suffering for granted. It also meant that very few people would ever do what I do. I had a knapsack and I packaged things so the colors that I needed the most for that painting would be in the knapsack. And then I suffered. I carried a tray and a chair and an easel, but I was young. Today, when I worked on this, I do it on my, on my deck. And it took me four trips to move these items because I'm not very strong anymore. And because I figured if I don't take one thing at a time, I'm gonna fall. And then my kids will get very upset with me because I promised them I would stop being careless. Tell how you had people help you when you were in the city and needed help in being able to do your paintings. Well, when I was a little girl in Vienna, I rem and I must have been about seven because we left when I was eight, there was somebody painting in the park and I rushed over to see and he chased me away. And I promised me that I would never do that to anybody. And I don't. I talk to everybody now and they help me. They sit with the painting if I have to go somewhere. They, it's just people, they bring me coffee. People love to see their neighborhoods being done. 
if I were to paint um, Australia by sitting in New York, people would smile and walk away. But, oh, that's my window. Oh, that's my street. Make sure you put the street sign there so people will know it's my street. We are neglected in this world. We need to know we exist. Don't make me talk this way because I miss New York. So Mary Lou, Bill Gray De Rodriguez said, wait, how many paintings have you done? Wait, say the... Uh, uh, Mary Lou, Bill Gray De Rodriguez. Wonderful. How many paintings have you done? Which painting took you more time to paint? Which colors do you use most? Oh, let me begin at the beginning. Okay. My favorite painting is of any of the old buildings I've done. But I think it may be the fish market because I never dreamed I could do a fish market. And there was one in Manhattan that, you know, when somebody commissioned me for something, I would give them a list of paintings I wanted to do. And I wanted to do this. And you know what happened? When I went there to do the fish market, I saw A.B. from the Second Avenue Deli and I said, A.B., what are you doing here? And he said, I buy my own fish. I don't let anybody else do it, which is why their food is so good. But the colors, you know what? Let me explain color a little bit because I would love to. Maybe from now on, I'll do one part of showing the colors that I use. So Mary Lou, let me see if this works. Joni feeds birds. There are so many on the ground. Before I do them, I took my sketchbook and I looked and I drew a couple of them with pencil so that I could erase. But Joni made photographs for me. The only trouble is it doesn't help me any because they're in my computer. And my computer, if I pr my printer only does black and white which t they turn into gray. And so I do have to use my eyes. Okay, here, you'll watch this bird growing. By next week, I'll have done patterns on them. First, I do a background color, any color that's dark. And the best colors, there's an alizarin crimson mixed with a deep green. And that is a joy beyond words. Those are the darks in there. And then you have to wait until it dries, and then you take the thinnest brush you have, and you thread a branch in, and then you throw a leaf over it. Does that explain enough? I have only one minute left. No. No. I no. Think you have nine minutes left. Oh, oh. So, up. Oh, the th <laughs> he put up a thumb, which really <laughs> <laughs> Sign language is important. <laughs> so here's another question. This one from your son. Was there anyone who inspired you and taught you in terms of learning to let go of judgment? There's an airplane. Say it again. Was there anyone who inspired you and taught you in terms of letting go of judgment? Mickey Burglass whom I talk, spoke about last week, who said, you're always going to be wrong. Because, and I spoke to David Rothenberg, who runs a fortune society, where I counsel when they allow me to leave my quarantine. And I said, what do you do when you meet somebody and you need to help them? He said, I learned their background. Because their background is what makes them work the way they do. And Harvey Wiesenberg said, I ask, what can they do? And Joe, Dr. Joe, said, find out who they are. Learn as much as you can. I am learning all the time. And I found that now that I do pencil drawings of people, because I'm not able to go to the city, 
I am learning that if I know them very well, I have to forget who they are because then I will tend to draw who I think they are. And I'm going into experiments. I have a friend named Linda whom I met through Erlan and she is allowing me to experiment. I found out that if we talk, I enjoy myself so much because she's interesting that I, I don't see her. So tomorrow I'll be drawing her. And I am learning so much during the COVID experience. Guys, this is your chance. So Greg has a question. Yes. Which one of your paintings has the most meaning for you or makes you the happiest and why? It's like saying, which child do you love the most? <laughs> I can't. I can't. How many paintings do you have? Well, this is, the, the subway is the 91st. When this is finished, but, but I'm speaking only of New York. I won't count this among the New York paintings. But wish that I can go back to the city eventually. I want to live to 100, okay? But I have a wonderful family who will go with me. And other friends have volunteered. Going with me means you carry stuff. If there are no more questions, did I finish the Mary Lou question? Because it was about color. She says, yes, you did very clearly. Thank Wonderful. You. And she also said that she has several of your pictures yes. that Aunt Paula sent you. Sent yes. Her, and yes. that they are her treasure. Yes. And if you can ever meet me in person, I would draw you by looking at you. So but, you know, I stopped working from photographs because they lie. How often do you have a photograph taken of you and you look at it and you say, that's not me. So let me tell you who is watching you. Meredith Romer, William Weinbaum, Greg Romer, Janine Schultz, Mary Lou Vilgray de Rodriguez, Jonah Burke, Joe Tripp, Susan Glauberman La Rosa, Jeffrey Kisman, Michael Burke. Wait, wait, let me just say one thing to Susan La Rosa. Susan, you and your Henry Street settlement are keeping me hopeful because I am so heartbroken about the children being taken away from their families. And the Henry Street Settlement deals with families. And the same issues which we have now with so many people coming for refuge. If we could expand the Henry Street Settlement into the world and into my government. When you talk about the children, what children are you talking about? I'm speaking of families which are not allowed to come in and the children are taken away from them in the hope that it'll stop more families from coming. But the people who do that do not realize to save your children from certain death or imprisonment, you will go anywhere and take the chance to save them. As I know we would have done if Panama would not have saved us. Barbara Feaster is here. Who? And Barbara Feaster. From Colorado. From Colorado is watching. 
and Same. Lauren Iacovoni Agaradis. That's my cousin. Greg's cousin is watching. Will it and be printed? Michael Kerr and Tammy Smith. And Julie Williams says, Hi, Hetty and family. We missed the beginning tonight, but we will watch the recorded version. Love you. I, I love this so much, guys. <laughs> I thank you so much. I can never answer on Facebook because I don't have the time. Because suddenly I'm getting questions from people that make me feel so guilty because I can't answer and I want to. But think a minute, I have painted thousands of people. In one painting there are 400. In one there are 300. I know all the people. They call me and dare I have to answer because I know them so well. You know what? I just want to say, I think that I do the paintings. Oh, I don't need my glasses anymore. I finished reading. But I'm doing this because I would like the universe to know that we should be allowed to continue because we're doing so much that makes global warming happen. And maybe like Venus, which has 400 degrees of heat, maybe we're going to extinct ourselves. I love you all. Thank you so much.